everybody, welcome to number 27. I'm Jack and this is a Volvo 123 GT. This car shows just how good Volvo used to be. So good, in fact, that the Amazon caused a bit of a scandal in the UK. We'll talk about that later. Had they continued to follow this path, Volvo could have become a powerhouse instead of a Chinese subsidiary. Let's look at what made it so good and also what caused Volvo to then go down a different path. This was the first Volvo to use a more modern design. Previous cars had big bulbous wheel arches front and back, for example, the sides went in. This is what is called the pontoon style of design where the whole side of the car was smoothed over and made into one piece. To my mind, it also has echoes of the Alfa Romeo Giulietta. It is a handsome car. Most 120 series cars or Amazon had between 85 and 100 horsepower. This though, the 123 GT had 115 horsepower from a higher compression B18B engine. The Amazon crucially was also the first car in the world that had seat belts. And this is something that we'll talk about later, but it's really, really important as to the evolution of what happened with Volvo. But back to the 123 GT. Other big differences were fully reclining, Recaro seats, this little shelf. It had a tachometer and a three spoke sports steering wheel with the special GT emblem. The gearbox, like the engine, was also taken from the P1800, the sports car. So it's a four speed with overdrive. Other features specific to this were the spotlights, those wing mirrors, but much more importantly, it also had a stiffer and lower suspension setup. Let's see how it drives. So there's an interesting story about why this car even came to exist in the first place. In those days, the P1800 body shell was being made in Britain. And we know what industrial relations were like. Because there were strikes ongoing, Volvo had a severe shortage of the coupe P1800 body shells. But it had a surplus of the power units and the gearbox. So it decided to use them up by creating a more sportier Amazon variant, this car. So it was almost a mistake. They were always used even before this was out there. They were very successful in rallying. So for example, I think they won twice in the Acropolis rally. But this wasn't created for that. This was created towards the end of the production run. So I think in 1968, they were only made for two years, the GTs. in a way was a halcyon era for Volvo because not only was it making cars that drove and handled like the best, but it also made cars that were incredibly tough. So you can see here, the advert in the States was basically entitled, drive it like you hate it. This is Volvo, the Swedish built compact. Volvo gets over 25 miles a gallon of gas, just like the little economy cars. And you can drive a Volvo like you hate it. Cheaper than psychiatry. Let's see how it goes down the road today. the beauty about an old car like this you can almost take it through all the gears without ending up doing a really silly speed you can get the most out of it so the b18b engine was a 1.8 four-cylinder 
The changes they made to the head, I think also to the exhaust, meant that it produced 115 horsepower, which was in a significant uplift from standard. Today, of course, it doesn't feel fast, but for a car of this era, it's really pretty peppy and comparable to the alphas that were around in those days. These actually drove so well and were so quick that it was the first ever foreign car used by a British contemporary. This caused an incredible amount of controversy back home. This is the scandal that I alluded to before because obviously the Brits were saying, hold on, why are you using a foreign car? Now the police at the time must have known that it would have been a com controversial decision to do that. So it just goes to show in how much reverence these cars were considered. So apart from the engine, how does it feel today? You have here this sports and inverted comma steering wheel, which is anything but because it's quite frankly massive. It's got a very, very thin rim, so it makes it really tactile to hold. It's got a ZF steering box. They're not supposed to be the best in terms of precision. And on the straight ahead, it does have a little bit of vagueness, but the moment you tip it into a corner, it's wonderfully sweet and it loads up really progressively. Also, it flows down a road like this. These cars were made for an era where you didn't just have straight flat roads like we're supposed to have now. And so they work so well with the bigger sidewalls, the way the suspension is set up. We're coming up to the S's now, so let's see how it does because they have a great reputation for handling. It's got a nice rasp to it at lower revs. Then gets a little bit rough higher up the rev range and it doesn't feel like it gives its very best right at the top. It feels like at the moment it's more tuned for mid-range. It has a couple of SU carbs and I'm a real fan of those. Um, Webers can produce more outright power. Let's just take it through the gears again. Webbers can produce more outright power, but they're never as usable as SUs. And these are so easy to tune. There's literally one little nut at the bottom to do the fueling. They're also more efficient. So if you're using a car every day rather than for racing or a scratcher, these are a great option. Brakes are really nice and firm. That gear change is so sweet and mechanical long throw from a really really long stick but it goes straight into the gearbox it's a four speed but it has overdrive which you switch on and off from the little lever on the side there so in essence it's a five speed gearbox back in the day there was some sort of technological barrier to making a normal five speed gearbox so they had these electrically operated overdrives drove this today you would be taken aback at just how good it is for a car that was designed in the 1950s it does have some of the traits of older cars i suppose that the steering is quite slow there's not much precision in it and once you tip it into the corner because the tires have such a sort of a, a big sidewall it can tend to sort of flop onto the sidewall you can feel that through the steering but apart from that it's got very, very drivable. The engine is flexible. The gear change is easy to use. The weighing on the steering is very good. It was a great car, a really great car for its time. At the moment, there's only one slight criticism I have of this car, and that is that I can't quite get comfortable in it. Now, I'm not sure if perhaps the seat can be adjusted further back um, by dismantling the runners, 
but there's plenty of room here still to the back seat and yet I can't go as far back as I need to. Uh, my legs are a little bit contorted down there. You do have a lot of room though, the pedals are placed pretty well. Now that tachometer unfortunately, although it is working, it stops going past, it seems to stop going past 4000, so I don't think it's a true affection of the engine rev, so you can't rely on that. Um, but ultimately it does rev up nicely enough. You've got this absolutely beautiful dash, which I guess emulates the Americans cars of the era, with the ribbon, speedo, and all the other sort of instruments. Interestingly, the 140 that came after this, there was an advert saying that Volvo was so confident and comfortable with their cars that rather than having five figures on the tachometer, like most other cars did, they had six, because a Volvo could and would go past 100,000 miles. So I find it really odd that Volvo made what was pretty much a class-leading car and then ended up in the wilderness years of the 70s and 80s up to the sort of early 90s where they were making cars that were dynamically not very good. Why is it that that happened? Well, it goes right back to an incredible innovation which, which this car had, which I mentioned before, and that was the seat belts. I think by the time this was made in 68, they were mandatory in most countries. Volvo made them available free to all other manufacturers. They didn't have to pay them any money to use them. So it was something very admirable that they did, but it seems to have set them down with an obsession of safety over everything else. So the cars that came after this were still pretty tough, rugged cars like this was, but they abandoned the fun of driving. So indirectly, one of the major advances of this car was also responsible for setting Volvo in a different direction. Now, can you imagine if they had carried on, they were clearly capable of producing cars that were great to drive like this. If they had carried on down that route, who knows what could have happened today? They may have been a powerhouse and not owned by a Chinese company. It's, um, it's food for thought. The other interesting thing about the Amazon generally, even these, is that they're still pretty undervalued compared to the competition. Uh, so I think you can get a very usable one for about sort of 12 to 15,000 pounds. You look at Giulietta of the same era, it's going to be over double that. They have appreciated a lot, so up till about three years ago, they were even cheaper, they were about half that price. But I think they really do deserve the increased demand. Now if you enjoyed this video, please do consider subscribing and hitting that notification button as well so you don't miss any of the other stuff that I make. If you want me to do a review on one of your cars, please get in touch at these addresses and we'll see if we can arrange something. Thank you all so much for watching. I really look forward to seeing you for the next one.